Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected. Crew Lab community, my name is Major Ian Brown. I'm the operations officer at the Crew Lab Center. And on behalf of Marine Corps University, Marine Corps University Foundation, Marine Corps Training Education Command, and the Brew Crew Lab Center for Innovation and Creativity, Welcome to the Brewcast, a series designed to connect the worlds of the warfighter and PME with the best and innovative and creative thought. Before we begin, please remember that all opinions expressed here are those of the individual and do not reflect the views of the Crew Lex Center, Marine Corps University, United States Marine Corps, or any other agency of the U.S. government. We will also be recording this webcast for the benefit of those in our community who could not join us today. So we ask that you be mindful of keeping your microphones muted to avoid disruptions and as well as turn off your webcams to help us stream the presentation smoothly. So today's broadcast features Major General William F. Mullen III, the Commanding General of the Marine Corps Training and Education Command. His past assignments include Commanding General of Marine Corps Air Ground Task Force Training Center in 29 Palms, the CJOC Director and Target Engagement Authority for Fires in Support of Iraqi Forces during Operation Inherent Resolve, and Director of the Capabilities Development Directorate, Combat Development and Integration. Uh, there's a full link to his full biography in the event page that you all registered at if you want to look a little deeper. And he is also the co-author of the book Fallujah Redux, The Ambar Awakening and the Struggle, again, uh, Struggle with Al-Qaeda, published by the Naval Institute Press. So in today's broadcast, General Mullen will present his PME on PME, addressing how military professionals can incorporate lifelong learning into a busy operational schedule. He will also discuss uh, the newest Marine Corps doctrinal publication, Marine Corps Doctrinal Publication 7, entitled Learning. Before we start, I'd like to ask one last time that all, everyone in the audience make sure your microphones are muted and cameras off if you haven't already done so. For the question and answer for this broadcast, uh, it's gonna be different from the previous ones since this uh, presentation is designed to be interactive. So as uh, Major General Mullen is presenting his information, uh, if you have a question you want to bring to his attention, go ahead and enter it in the chat room and I'll be monitoring that. And uh, we'll bring the question up in real time and have him address it and then move forward. Okay, so with all of that, uh, General Mullen, over to you, sir. Okay, great. Can you hear me okay, Major Brown? Yes, sir. Okay. Hey, uh, thanks for tuning in today. And. Um, you know, everybody's just demonstrating keen interest in professional military education. You know, a lot of people look at the title and that's PME on PME and they kind of wonder, well, what do you mean? And the, the presentation's purpose is to demonstrate the importance of personal professional development. That's what this is about, which might seem odd. I think most of you tuning in here probably get that intuitively, but I've been presenting this in a number of different venues to try and get all Marines to understand how important uh, pursuit of personal professional development actually is. So that's what this is designed to do. Um, as Major Brown said, uh, if you have questions, comments, pop them up in the chat box. I, I like interactive, though things get a little bit slower when you're trying to do this online. Um, I would also tell you um, this brief is designed to be given to Marines in general. So if you are not a Marine, um, please don't take any offense at some of the things we talk about in here. Uh, it has a heavy Marine flavor. I apologize up front for that, sort of. It's a Marine thing, and you're on a Marine site, so that's what this is about. So, Ian, if you go to the next slide, please. Okay, first of all, it's about professionalism. And again, that, that may sound obvious, but it never ceases to amaze me the number of people that don't really understand that they've joined a profession. And with a profession comes obligations. And we're going to talk about those obligations. But what it comes down to for each and everybody out there, because this is designed to get people to think, talk, understand um, you decide your own level of professionalism and for those in leadership positions you you decide your subordinates level of professionalism also and for the marine corps and i guess any service where you know we, if you're involved as a leader um, you get the type of marine corps you expect inspect and enforce so that's why it's not only you setting the example for doing these things it's also you getting your subordinates to do the same thing next slide please This is uh, General Martin Dempsey has a very good and very well-deserved reputation for professionalism, um, for being a student of his profession, and here's how he views, he views uh, what we're going to be talking about today. Um, you can go ahead and read that. Uh, it's renewing our commitment to the profession of arms. 
We've got to have the best trained force in the world. And that's the foundation, leadership is the foundation of our profession. Next slide, please. Okay, so what is a profession? You, know, you see some of the things on there. We've got lawyers, we've got doctors, we have professors, um, religious personnel. And there are folks that don't really believe that military leaders are professionals. Uh, military members are professionals. And I'm here to tell you, we absolutely are. Uh, but again, with each one of those professions, um, there's, a, there's a continuing education requirement. You know, I also often ask people, um, would you want to go to a lawyer that passed the bar exam and never studied again, never kept up with his or her profession? Uh, same thing with a doctor. And you know, most people call that malpractice. Well, unfortunately, we have that happening in our own ranks um, with people that have decided they're good enough, they're smart enough, you know, they, they've reached a plateau, they don't need to take it any further. Um, and again, I would refer to that as malpractice, and that's why I do this brief. But in order to, to continue, I like to set the groundwork with uh, some definitions. Next slide, please. Okay. This is the definition of a profession. Let's read through that in a little bit. And I would ask you as you're reading through it, um, if, if there's some things that stand out to you, go ahead and pop that in the chat window. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that I think stand out to me. The first thing is discretionary practice, which means you got to think, you got to make decisions. Not everybody can do it. There's an expectation of reliable and effective application, specialized knowledge or skill. And to me, the most important part is the mastery of that specialized knowledge or skill requires continuous study and practice. Does anything else stand out to folks there? have a sense of corporate identity, collective responsibility for the quality of the service delivered. Those are all things that have a tendency to stand out when I'm actually presenting to the person. Yes, warranted by society. Thanks, Erica. Absolutely. There's got to be a there's got to be a trust of that profession by the people it serves. Now we'll move on to the profession of arms. Next, please. Okay. Profession of arms is a little different. Experts in the ethical application of combat power. And you have folks asking about this. You know, it's one of the reasons why we use rules of engagement. It's one of the reasons why we fight the way we do, why we pay particular attention to collateral damage and try and avoid it. Um, why we try to make sure that our actions in combat um, live up to the law of armed conflict, uh, because it's, that's the ethical application of combat power. And I have seen Militaries around the world that don't really care about that at all. And uh, trust me, uh, it is a problem. The next thing that people tend to pick out is serving under civilian authority. And one of the questions I frequently ask people is, um, do civilians have the right to be wrong? Our civilian leadership. And they absolutely do. They are elected by the people, the, Amer the American people. Um, they're they are answerable to the American people. They're not answerable to us. We provide our best military advice, they make the decision, and we execute to the best of our ability. We're entrusted to defend the Constitution and rights and interests and lives of the American people. Um, that Constitution piece is tremendously important because there are militaries around the world that don't swear to a form of government. They swear to a political party. In some cases, they swear to an individual. Um, that's, I think, where you start to run into serious problems. Uh, and one last thing is, um, you know, with the military, uh, obviously there's a lot of power, um, a lot of ability there, uh, and we use it in the service of the state um, as the state directs. Uh, there are militaries around the world that are considered very unprofessional because when they decide they don't like something, uh, they they change the government, and that's completely inappropriate. That's not what we do. Um, and thank you, Tim. In Chile, they swear allegiance to Chilean flag. Absolutely. Okay. Any other comments on the profession of arms? I'll wait a second. All right, next slide, please. Okay, here are some of the foundations of our profession. I don't think there's any surprises on there, but every profession has them. They're, they're what we operate off of, our core values, our creeds, our doctrine. Of course, in the military, we have the Uniform Code of Military Justice. It does set us apart from the public we serve and protect. Um, so it, it's, a, it's different. 
Next slide, please. We have a bit of a challenge. Over time, as illustrated by this quote, there are members of the military service that look upon it as an honorable occupation rather than a serious profession, demanding no less intellectual dedication than that of a doctor, lawyer, or the engineer. And the man who wrote that, Dr. Williamson Murray, um, is a good friend of mine. Um, he has said on many occasions that he firmly believes the military profession is the most physically and intellectually demanding profession on the face of the earth, and I couldn't agree with him more. But again, that comes with requirements. Next, next slide, please. A quote from more recent times, the future of the Army report in 2016. Anti-intellectualism. Not new, but it has grown as an unintended consequence of the recent wars. And I would ask you to think about it. Think about your experience in the military. Um, does this describe us also? I personally believe it does from what I've seen. Next slide, please. A little bit more from General Dempsey. The purpose of PME in general, to be a broad body of professional knowledge and develop habits of mind essential to the military professional. I think the most important word in there is habits. The habits of mind means that you, you do them all the time. You do them as a matter of course. Um, you don't have to think about them very much. It's just your routine. It's what you do um, to, to enhance your professionalism um, and stay at the leading edge of what's going on. Next slide, please. Okay. Because what we do comes with special trust and confidence. We, our, our commissions uh, indicate that special trust and confidence is in place in us, and we take an oath swearing that we will uphold and defend the Constitution, and we will serve to the best of our ability in the office we're about to enter, um, and that's that's pretty profound. It means we have a lot to live up to. And our credibility is tremendously important. So things that we see that hit the news that, that take away from our credibility, um, with less than 1% of the United States uh, population having ever even served in the military, and in some cases even knowing somebody in the military, sometimes all they ever see is something that pops up on the news or on a blog site or in social media about the Marine Corps. And all of that, uh, if it's negative, can take away from all the good things we do every single day of the year. Next slide, please. Okay. But I tell you, um, the continuing education piece, the keeping up with things, um, I would ask you, what happens when you don't PT? And one of the things I think about is, you know, it, you start pushing maximum density in your clothing or utilities. Um, that, you know, with your mind, if you aren't constantly exercising your mind, challenging your mind, um, you lose it. Uh, next slide, please. I'll tell you, there was actually a study done that uh, measured brainwave activity um, when people were sleeping and then watching TV, and there was actually more brainwave activity when people were asleep than they were when they were watching TV. Um, I just bring that up as an uh, one of the things that has a tendency to take away from take time away from our ability to continue studying our profession. Next slide, please. And there are many who don't think this is a form of exercise, but how many of you have read a really difficult book and come away and just, you're tired, you're mentally drained? Um, it's the same thing. Uh, it's, except you're using the most powerful muscle in your body, which is the one between your ears. Uh, it's your brain. And that's why I think it's tremendously important to keep exercising it, keep pressing it, keep getting it developed, keep getting it better. Um, there's been studies on Alzheimer's patients and the synaptic connections in the brain um, over time, if they're not used, they deteriorate um, and they wear away. And when you continually challenge yourself, you make more synaptic connections, you reinforce the ones that exist, you build new ones, um, and you're better able to handle things going on around you um, as long as you keep that process going. Um, but just like PT and exercise, uh, if you slack off, things start deteriorating. Next slide. 
because professionalism is very hard to develop because it's very perishable and it must be refreshed at every opportunity. Next slide, please. I'll give you a second to read through this. And I will tell you what this is about is, you know, that embarrassed by the performance, um, Yena and Auerstadt, that was in 1806 against Napoleon. Um, and the, the Prussian army essentially lost the war in one day. Uh, and they essentially worked for Napoleon um, for quite a few years after that because the French dominated them and essentially occupied their country. Um, I can't think of anything more embarrassing uh, to have happen than what happened to them. And Scharnhorst uh, took that to heart. Uh, and he built up a profession, um, you know, the, the gen German general staff, uh, he really turned things around for the Prussian military so that when they finally came out from under, they were in on the kill with, uh, on Napoleon in 1815 at Waterloo. Um, as a matter of fact, they kind of saved the day by coming in uh, on, the, on Napoleon's right flank uh, right at the end of the battle. But again, uh, experience, experience as a teacher, uh, it, can be the best teacher, but we rarely do we get the luxury of choosing the time, manner, or place of our own experience. Um, and also, those who expect to learn everything from experience are like the proud men who believe they already know everything. And the two things at the bottom, build on as I've obviously mentioned up in the slide, um, it's, it's interpreted variously, but I think about it as the burning desire to know, always wanting to know more, always getting better, always studying. And on the right hand side is Japanese concept of Kaizen which means avoiding the plateaus where people just kind of get comfortable. I'm good enough. I don't need to improve. Maybe I can't improve. Um, Kaizen is always climbing, always getting better, always improving. Next slide, please. Okay. Because we are defined by our strength and character, lifelong commitment, maintain our professional abilities, and continuous improvement. That's what we do. That's what all of us should be devoted to be doing. Next slide, please. Okay, that experience part. I bring this one up because um, while this was going on during the original march up, uh, I was the lieutenant colonel of the joint staff sitting in the Pentagon kicking myself going, damn it, I missed it. Because I had no choice in where I was at. Uh, I was, we were all told to sit down, shut up, don't ask for orders, leave. Uh, and so as all this was going on, I got the, the pleasure of watching all this on the news. As I said, it's uh, not the experience I wanted. Um, I would have preferred to have been out there, but didn't have a choice. Next slide, please. Okay. But as you build knowledge and experience, you gain competence. And competence gives you confidence, the confidence to lead, the confidence to deal with complex problems. That's what's so important about this. You've got to have confidence, and it only comes from confidence. Next slide, please. Because, as Thomas Friedman said, when the world is flat or hot, flat, and crowded, one of the two, I can't remember which one, uh, no such thing as lifetime employment anymore. There's only lifetime employability. So if you don't keep climbing, if you don't keep trying to get better, you're going to get left behind. And it's, it's sometimes that means you no longer have a job. In the military, that means you're not getting promoted, um, up or out. And uh, so you've got to continually get better uh, if you expect to be continue to be employed. Next slide, please. Okay, no quote would be, no brief would be complete without St. Mattis. Uh, but again, knowledge and experience equals wisdom. And that gives you the ability to define, refine your judgment. Uh, because judgment being the key, that's that discretionary piece we talked about with regards to a profession. Um, when we talk about experience, there's the actual experience piece, but there's also the vicarious experience piece. And in many ways, vicarious experience, you can always get, and you should continually be building, um, you know, knowledge comes with that also, but learning from other people's mistakes is enormous. Next slide, please. Okay. And this is what Frederick Great had to say. Past facts are good. Storing imagination and memory 
uh, the repository of ideas once the supply of materials may be obtained, but it has to be purified by passing through the strains of judgment. As I often say, I read a great deal. It doesn't give me answers, but it helps me come up, come up with answers. Uh, it's that repository uh, of ideas. And um, so um, it's, I'm much more able to come up with ideas and come up with ways to deal with things, uh, I think, quite a bit faster than other folks who don't do that. So when they reach into the toolbox, there's not a whole lot in there. Next slide, please. And this is another aspect, of, you know, I'm responsible for all training and education in the Marine Corps, and training is tremendously important because it certainly prepares us for what we know we have to do in combat. But in many ways, education is much more important because when things change, when we reach the, get confronted with the unexpected or the unknown, which we always do, you're better prepared to deal with that. You're better, better prepared to come up with options. Next slide, please. And the other aspect, you know, in the military profession in particular is, you know, when we're junior officers or junior leaders, um, the bottom part of that slide there, you know, the physical aspects of our profession, you know, we always got to be there, always got to be leading, always got to be bringing, you know, people forward and, and setting the example in everything we do. Um, and a lot of that is physical. Um, you got to be there to lead. Uh, but as you get more senior, so it's on the top of the slide, uh, the challenges are more intellectual. Um, we need to be able to think. We need, we need to be able to have good judgment. Uh, we need to be wise. Um, and it's a constant process because, as we all know, the only constant thing in the world is change. Uh, if we aren't keeping up with it, we're getting left behind. And in our profession, that is a very bad thing. Next slide. Quick quote from General Dunford kind of a synopsis of what we've been talking about. Next slide, please. Okay. This is part of the challenge we have. You know, people have been watching us fight for the last 15 to 18 years. They know what we're good at. They know what we're not good at. So the folks that don't like us very much and the list is fairly long out there. Um, they're trying to prepare to fight us and not oppose our strengths, but focus on our weakness. And this is a good example of that. You know, if you're going to play, uh, you know, if you're going to have a, a boxing match and a game of Trivial Pursuit, you want to prepare Trivial Pursuit against Mike Tyson uh, and box Alex Trebek because that's what they're trying to do. Um, that's what we have to be ready for. Next slide. But part of the challenge we have is all the information out there that's coming at us. And I'm sure many of you, like me, feel at times that you're this young man in the picture with a fire hose in the face, trying to keep up with it, trying to figure out what's important, what's not, which means we all have to be developing a filter. Next slide. Okay inundated with unlimited, unfiltered, and unmanaged data. You know, most people learn anything they want, but it's all low-level information at the to the detriment of higher order comprehension. We have facts at our fingertips, but we don't really know what those facts mean. We don't know how they relate to what we're trying to do. Um, I think that's a very constant theme that we see. Next. Which results in this. Data rich increasingly knowledge poor. Data helps to a degree. Actual knowledge, meaning something we can use uh, to make ourselves better, to apply to the situation at hand, that's much better. Next slide. Okay, which is what critical thinking is about. How do you get to the point where we develop ourselves, we develop our subordinates to be able to think critically? to be able to take things with a grain of salt, to resist bias, to resist um, ego, and try and be as open-minded as possible, to listen to what people have to say, take it on board, uh, and then filter it, okay? I got that, I understand where they're coming from. Doesn't mean you have to agree with it, but you're trying to understand because they think 
you know, there you have to assume people are, are as smart as you are, um, and you can possibly learn from them. Uh, but that critical thinking piece is tremendously important, especially nowadays um, with the blogosphere where people are starting to call them echo chambers, where everybody's just kind of talking to each other. Nobody's really going, oh, hey, wait a second. Nobody's playing devil advocate, devil's advocate. Saying, wait a second, have we, have we really thought about this? Is, is that actually true? Um, and getting to the heart of the matter and digging into it objectively uh, instead of just taking a hook, line, and sinker saying, yep, I got it. That's what I believe in. Next slide, please. Okay, because what we're paid to do is make decisions. And I'll tell you, you know, I've, I've read a great deal about decision making. Um, there's a lot of books out there, some good, some not so good. And I try and simplify things as much as I possibly can. And for the purpose of this, the way I per personally do this and other people would do it differently is I break decision making down into three levels, analytical, recognition prime, and intuitional. Analytical being, you know, that's the Marine Corps planning process or military uh, planning process. I mean, it's it's pulling together a team, a lot of time, a lot of information, you know, examining the problem, working out potential ways of dealing with that problem, wargaming those things, coming to a decision, but it requires time and it requires information, which we generally don't have, especially uh, in combat. So the next level uh, is referred to as recognition prime decision making. Chess players use that. Um, they see a pattern developing in front of them, and they've played so much, they've read so much about chess, they understand what's happening, uh, and they're able to make decisions and counter what's happening much faster, or take advantage of weaknesses they see developing in their opponent much faster. Um, doesn't take a whole lot of time. Uh, but what it, that does require is a lot of knowledge and a lot of experience. Uh, and the highest level is intuitional. Um, it's what Malcolm Gladwell talked about in Blink. Um, the fallacy being that uh, there's a lot of people that think they can do this, but they can't actually do it. It's almost knowing the answer before the question gets fully asked. Um, I've seen some people able to do this. The knowledge and the experience level are, are just unbelievable how high it needs to be to be able to truly do this. And again, many think they can. Um, I haven't seen that many that actually can uh, do it right. Next slide, please. And part of the problem we have is bias. The top picture there is from the Russo-Japanese War in 1905. And everything that made that war, um, or excuse me, everything that made World War I a slaughter existed in that war. Fast firing artillery, barbed wire, machine guns. All the Europeans and us, the Americans, we all sent representatives to go observe that fight. Uh, we saw a great deal uh, and really didn't come away with all that much that we thought ought to apply when we got into the next big fight, which happened in 1914 in World War I. Um, one of the things I always point out is that that top picture there, you know, all the Russians are barefoot. And so a lot of the observers are kind of like, you got to be kidding me. Um, but that's a Russian approach to things. That's the best way to deal with trench foot. Um, as long as it's not freezing cold, um, that's one of the best ways to deal with trench foot. And the Russians do things very simply. And um, there's the old story that uh, Senator John Glenn told when he was in a conversation with a cosmonaut and he was bragging about this great pen that American engineering had come up, come up with to write in it, you know, no gravity, uh, upside down, whatever, always writes. Um, and the Russian just kind of looked at him, pulled a pencil out of his pocket and showed him a pencil that could do the same thing. So again, very simple. The bottom picture in this is July 1916, July 1st, it's the Battle of the Somme. Um, almost two years into World War I, been massive casualties um, all through the first couple of years of the fighting. Doesn't seem like much was learned. And on that day, the British launched an offensive on the River Somme and took 60,000 casualties in one day. 20,000 of them at least uh, were dead. And that's the price of incompetence. Um, it's just absolutely stunning uh, what happened with that. Um, I would also tell you, though, that the French were not much better. In the spring of 1917, they launched a massive offensive. They'd taken so many casualties up to that point that the, their morale was on a knife edge. Uh, they were promised by a new commanding general that everything would be better this time. They'd win. And they had similar losses to what happened to the British on the Somme and almost the entire French army mutinied. Um, some divisions actually killed their officers and left. 
Um, others said, yeah, we're not attacking anymore. We'll defend, but we won't attack anymore. And it was a massive crisis that um, they were able to keep from the Germans for the most part. Um, but Americans entered the war in April 1917. Because we were so unprepared, we didn't actually start fighting until fighting hard until May of 1918. And we immediately started taking massive casualties. Essentially, from May to November 11th, we had over 100,000 casualties, over 100,000 killed um, in the fighting because of our approach. Um, the English and the French tried to show us our, their lessons learned. Um, we were much smarter. Didn't work very well. Next slide, please. And then we have General William Westmoreland. He was in charge of Vietnam for four years. He had two essential tasks, figure out the type of war they're fighting and figure out a way to win it. And he failed on both counts. He tried very, very hard, but I would tell you that he wasn't equipped to deal with it. Uh, he graduated from West Point in 1936. By 1945, at the end of World War II, he was an artillery regimental commander, full bird colonel. A couple of years after that, at probably maybe two years after that, uh, he was a general. Um, in the 1950s, they offered him the opportunity to go to the Army War College. Um, he uh, declined. He said, I'll go there to teach if you want, but I don't need to go there as a student. Um, didn't study his profession. It was all about looking good, looking sharp, being ready, um, spit shine, polish, and um, didn't work out well. Four years. There was a guy named Louis Sorley, a retired Army colonel, who wrote a book called Westmoreland, The Man Who Lost the War. One of the questions I always ask people is, how did you like to have a book written about you like that? Um, Westmoreland then wrote a second book, excuse me, uh, Sorley wrote a second book um, called A Better War, and it's about Creighton Abrams who took over for General Westmoreland. And Creighton Abrams understood what needed to be done, but by that time, we'd lost the confidence of the American public, and they'd pulled the plug and said, forget it, we're done. Um, actually, things were going fairly well um, in Vietnam um, to a degree. Um, if you read about the measures we were taking, they're the right ones. But by that time, the American public said, that's it, we're done. That's our fault. That's not the American public's fault. Next slide. And the continuing education piece, you know, one of the things I always think about is this man right here. He had at most two years of formal education. He uh, self-made lawyer. When he became president of the United States, he was elected in November of 1860. Back then, the inaugurations didn't happen until March. Because he was elected, southern states started to succeed, uh, secede from the Union. His predecessor, ah, just let him go. Didn't want to do anything about it. Wasn't willing to put, in, put forth any effort. President Lincoln, President-elect Lincoln had to watch all that from November to March. And then when he took over in March, he was presented with uh, Fort Sumter running out of ammunition, running out of food actually running out of food. They hadn't started shoot, fight, uh, fighting yet. Um, it needs to be resupplied or they're going to surrender. First week in office. How would you like that? Um, no military training. Um, he studied military theory to the point where he actually, as you go through, you know, like a book like Team of Rivals, he actually knew more than his military generals did um, until he was, and he kept firing uh, northern generals until he finally found a combination that worked and Grant in the east, Sherman in the west, um, and it finally worked. But he did that himself. Um, and it's pretty frustrating to read about how he was treated, uh, the things that were said about him, but the most amazing thing is his perseverance through it all. Um, you know, huge losses, um, battles lost uh, over and over again. Um, draft riots in New York City to the point where they had to use uh, military forces to put them down um, in New York City. Um, it just, you know, government running out of money, uh, just unbelievable what he put up with and still persevered through it. Next slide, please. And of course, back to Joe Mattis again. To me, the most important part is that studying, vice just reading our profession. Because at the bottom there, winging it and filling body bags as we sort out what works reminds us of the moral dictates and the cost of competence in our profession. Next slide, please. Okay. 
I once asked uh, retired Lieutenant General Van Riper, um, who was one of the, who was the first president of Marine Corps University, um, tremendously smart guy. Um, so how, what's the best approach to studying our profession? And he said, you need to cast your net widely. There's a number of different areas that you, you have to um, delve into to truly understand all aspects of our profession. Uh, and this was the list he gave me. As you can see, it's pretty wide variety and uh, it can be fairly surprising. Next slide, please. What I'll tell you is all of that I've, all that I've been talking about um, is the genesis behind why we did a new Marine Corps doctrine publication on learning. It's the why. Why is this important? Get Marines to understand. You know, there's a lot of folks who talk about maneuver warfare and you know what we you know we don't live up to our philosophy. And I I, I, I will the first one to tell you we certainly don't. You know, cause the uh, previous comment to ask um, how do we reinvigorate re, excuse me how do we reinvigorate maneuver warfare? Um, and I'll tell you um, for starters, people don't really understand it. And it's because a lot of people have not read, they haven't even read MCDP-1 um, and then other books related to it that help explain how it's supposed to work, why it's so important. Um, and this, you know, I've been watching that for many, many years. And so that's why we developed this MCDP to get people to understand the why of learning, the why it's so important they continuously get better, why they need to continually hone that intellectual edge to be able to beat anybody uh, that we come across. Next slide, please. because this is what it's about. You know, new warfare requires thinking subordinates. You know, you get your intent from the commander, you execute off that intent to the best of your ability, you take intelligent initiative, conditions change, you adjust quickly. Um, it's how to think uh, versus what to think. It's not telling people what to do, it's telling them in general, here's what we need to do, and then letting them figure out how they're going to actually do it. Um, that intent piece requires a great deal of trust me as the senior talking to the subordinate, I understand that that subordinate is going to think and is competent enough to carry out the mission to the best of their ability, uh, at least cost to ourselves. And then the other part of that is the subordinate trusts the senior that conditions change, we need to do something different, we'll still accomplish the intent. The senior will move to support the subordinate, understanding that that's what, that's what we need to do. Next slide, please. And then how will training education command change? Um, we're already in the process of doing it. We're calling it 21st century learning. In the June issue of the Gazette, we lay a great deal of it out. Um, and what it's essentially talking about is, you know, in the simplest terms, we need to move away from the focus on the process of how we train and educate our Marines and focus on the product, which is our Marines. Uh, what do they understand? What do they retain? How competent they are in the skills that we need them to be competent in when they move, when they leave our schools and go out to the operating forces? And even more so, what can we do to help them while they're out there to build skills through micro video learning, computer-based training, other things to kind of build a little bit of at a time uh, as they're ready to receive it? So those are some of the changes you're going to see. But if you'd like to know more, um, so that in the interest of getting to the question and answer, um, the June issue of the Gazette lays out a great deal of this. Next slide, please. Because this is one of the problems we have. We have to make sure we're not overconfident because that can lapse into carelessness. Because we have some obvious advantages. We've had a record of success. Mixed, but for the most part, success. If we get overconfident, we have a problem. This carelessness can lead to error, and error can lead to defeat. There's a, a monograph that was put out by the Combat Studies Institute of the Army, who does great work, by the way, um, and it's called We Were Caught Unprepared. And what it talks about is the Israeli Army going into southern Lebanon in 2006. The previous 10 to 15 years, they've been fighting a, a counterinsurgency campaign against the Palestinians. A lot of their core skills, their core combat skills, had atrophied. Uh, they are overconfident. Um, and when they actually put ground troops uh, into the fight in southern Lebanon, they were fighting a, an organization that was a non-state entity but had state-like capabilities, military capabilities, uh, and it didn't go well for them. 
they took a lot of casualties. And because they didn't clearly win, they lost. And we have that same problem. You know, if we don't clearly win the next fight we're in, then we've lost in the eyes of everybody to include ourselves. And I will tell you, as Commanding General Training Education Man, uh, the thing that worries me the most and the thing I want to make sure never happens that somebody writes a monograph about us entitled, We Were Caught Unprepared. We can't let that happen. Next slide, please. Because these, these are the folks that pay the bill. Somebody's son, somebody's daughter, somebody's brother or sister, you know, that cost of competence, the filling the, the body bags by winging it, um, these are the people that fill the body bags. And we always have to keep that uppermost in our minds. Our Marines deserve the best possible leadership and professionalism we can deliver them every day. Next slide, please. And then back to the beginning. Please remember, you decide your level of professionalism and your sports level of professionalism. Okay, so that wraps up the presentation. So what I'd like to be able to do now is open it up for questions and I will answer questions as long as people are asking. And we can either do them by chat um, or you can pipe up um, on by uh, unmuting your mic. All right, great. Thank you, sir. Yeah, at this point, uh, if anyone's got anything, go ahead and either throw it in the chat and the mic. And if, uh, if somebody's asking a question, I'll make sure I monitor the chat and get it in there. And sir, uh, I'll throw one thing out there to start off. So uh, Jamie Macias had thrown into the chat, not so much a question, but a comment about uh, metacognition, the thinking about thinking. Uh, is that something you could maybe elaborate on a little bit um, as well, like in, in terms of how that has driven some of the 21st century learning changes as well as MCDP7? Yeah, part of it is um, you know, that thinking about thinking piece. It's, it's you know, how do you go about thinking through problems? Um, how do you avoid the pitfalls um, that some people fall into with ego and bias, the things that keep you from making good decisions, keep you from seeing all the things that you need to see? Um, how, you know, are, when I say open-minded, that doesn't mean you're, you're, you're flip-flopping all over the place and you're, you're allowing other people to make up your mind for you, but you're at least listening to other folks and thinking about what they're, they're saying instead of thinking about what you want to say to counter them. You know, I, I, I do my best not to watch any of the cable news networks anymore because it seems like all they ever do is argue with each other and maybe if I just shout louder um, you know you'll be converted my way of thinking and uh, I just I it drives me crazy uh, but that metacognition piece is enormously important because it's the discipline of thinking um, and understanding what you, you know what your weaknesses are what your strengths are it's focusing on your your weaknesses to make them better um, to enhance them so maybe they're not weaknesses anymore um, and I think probably one of the most important pieces of that, uh, Carol Dweck put out a book called Mindset. And if you have the mindset, a fixed mindset, that means, hey, you know, this is as good as I'm ever going to get. I'm, I'm, that's it. I'm, I'm, I'm done growing. Uh, I'm not even going to challenge myself because I might look bad. Um, as opposed to the growth mindset where uh, it's that Kaizen piece. Never plateau, always getting better. Um, this is not as good as it gets. I'll never reach that. I'm going to keep striving, but I'll never reach that. Um, you know, that you've got to be thinking that way and understanding, you know, that you're continually sharpening the edge, making it better. Um, and part of that is understanding, you know, hey, there's, there's a lot of smart people out there. Maybe we don't have a corner market on all the good ideas. So one of the questions from Tim Sparks, what is the correct mix of what we might call general education, things everyone should study, and specialized education electives pursuing topics uh, with your interest set? Um, part of that is when, you, when you're in a school environment, they do a lot of things that kind of help you um, understand where you should be exploring. Um, and, it, and what that enables you to do is ideally, once you've graduated from that or moved on from that program, is understand where else you could explore and where else you need to know what you would like to know more about. Um, when it comes to casting a wide net, when I'm reading, um, I'm reading about a lot of different things. Some things are very, very difficult, like philosophy. I have a tough time with philosophy. Um, I can only take it in small doses, um, but I also intermix that in with things uh, like fiction, 
because that gives you some interesting ideas at times. Um, it's all trying to understand the human condition, you know, classical literature, um, you know, mixing that in with science, systems theory, other things. I mean, you, the more you mix it up, the more you try to understand the human condition um, because we all lead humans um, and we're trying to get them to do things that humans don't naturally do. The more you understand, I think the better off you are. So I think it's important that you have a good foundation in general education, uh, but you pursue specialized interests because that second word is pretty key. If you're interested in it, you're going to learn much better. Um, and if you're pursuing your own interests, um, you know, in light of your profession and making yourself better, um, I don't think it can get much better than that. And then Sebastian Bay. So given how people learn differently, how do you think the PME system should adapt for 21st century learning and education? Um, the PME system is, um, we're, we're much better on the officer side than we are on the enlisted side. The enlisted side is catching up more quickly. Um, we're doing more uh, business, excuse me, uh, case case studies, um, decision forcing functions, um, tactical decision games, uh, getting people to think. Um, it's it's challenging people. It's in some ways a Socratic method of asking questions, not providing answers, and and instigating people to think, um, which I think is very very important. And then how do people learn? First of all, understanding people learn in different ways. And then when you have a group of folks coming in, you identify different ways that they learn and you try and take advantage of that. Because one of the things we're trying to do is how, what are the different ways we can deliver, uh, you know, what we're trying to uh, provide people, the education, what are different ways to deliver that? Um, and, you know, where there's the standard way, um, which has been used in the military, you know, some people call it the Frederick Taylor system. Um, he was the guy that was Mr. Yeah, sir. Oh, good. Okay, I'm back up. But I, for whatever reason, we lost internet connection, so I don't know what's going on with that. Okay, so we can well, continue. We'll... If you want to read off the question, I'll answer it. Yes, sir. Yeah, we still have a pretty good audience here, so um, go ahead. I think uh, the last question you had was from Sebastian Bay. Was that right? Yes. Okay. So we'll move on down to uh, Major Tim Riemann. He's asking, "What educational initiatives within the Marine Corps are you most excited about, or show the most potential?" Um, one of the things we're working on right now is we have a, a, a big problem with Marines awaiting training. And so what we, what we do is when young Marines get to their MOS school, um, in many cases we have to wait for, uh, you know, a quorum to show up for lack of a better term, um, and then put them into the course when the course date starts. In some cases we've got people waiting for a couple of months and I've always found that to be nuts. And so one of the initiatives we're working on, and we've tried a couple of, um, low-level experiments in a couple of places and it worked really well is they show up, they get administratively checked in, we give them their syllabus uh, on a tablet, they work through it individually as a group or as a group, um, the instructor's there to coach, teach, mentor, and when they demonstrate the necessary level of cap competence in their MOS, what we need them to be able to know when they move on, um, then they just move on. There's no start date, there's no graduation date, and one of the things we're finding is young Marines who've grown up with this stuff, they're eating it up, uh, and they're getting through much faster, and they understand things a heck of a lot better than the way we were doing it before. And so now, you know, it's, you know, the IT bandwidth issues we have, um, we're trying to expand that. Um, we're buying technology, um, tablets, and other things. Um, it's a slow-moving process, um, trying to get the approvals to do, do these things. Where we're doing it experimentally at the Intel School and Comelec School and, um, down at, uh, at one of the MATSIGs at uh, Pensacola. Um, every time we've done it, it shows great results. And so our issue now is how do we expand that so that we're doing that everywhere we possibly can. All right, thank you, sir. All right, next question is from Captain Rick Clay asking, for those in the reserve component, how do we incorporate some of the perspectives that people bring from their experiences in a civilian environment while maintaining, or sorry, while remaining grounded in the core of military reason and decision making, especially outside of the combat arms occupational fields where civilian concepts might be more applicable. Over. Yeah, uh, you know, part of that is, you know, the, everything we've talked about here applies in civilian occupations um, just as much, and you know, as in the military, because you still got to be good at your job, and conditions change, and you got to keep getting better. Um, so a lot of things we talked about um, are just as applicable, um, but for reserves, reserve uh, personnel, um, their experiences are important. 
because in many ways, you know, one of the things that uh, I like to talk about is diversity. And it's not diversity from the standpoint of people of different color, people of different sex, whatever it is. It's diversity of thought which generally comes when people that don't look like you come into the room uh, and bring something new to the table. Cause we all, you know, we're all faced with really complex challenges. Uh, and the more we end up, you know, have more, have people that look at things different ways and come up with something that, well, hang on a second. Did you ever think maybe we could do it this way? Um, you know, bring a different viewpoint in. Um, I think that's tremendously important. And that's something, you know, I've been on I and I duty. That's something reservists always do. Um, uh, is that different viewpoint. And in many cases, it's something I hadn't thought of or something that we hadn't thought of. And it, it proves to be quite valuable uh, because it's different experiences, different ways of looking at things, um, and it brings more to the table. So I think that's tremendously important. Um, but when it comes to the profession of arms, um, I think the reservists also have a very difficult challenge. Um, it, you you got to work fast, work harder at it. You know, you've got to understand things better. Um, and it's it's quite a challenge um, that the reserves deal with when they're on active duty, um, when they're, you know, for AT or their drill weekends. And you got to put max effort into it, which I know is difficult because you got a day job. Um, so, but when it comes down to it, um, if the unit gets mobilized, um, you know, again, the young Marines pay the price. We've got to get it right. All right. Uh, next question is from Master Sergeant Matthew Higgins over at the College of Enlisted Military Education. Okay. He's asking, based on the success of both uh, officer PME and enlisted PME going fully virtual due to the COVID restrictions, yes. do you foresee do you see the uh, foresee this changing the future of overall PME delivery construct? Over. Oh, absolutely. Because one of the things that the Commandant's been talking to us about is like, look, we've changed a lot of things due to COVID. Um, we wouldn't be particularly smart if we just went back to the old way of doing things. You know, what have we learned to do this COVID thing? What works really well? Um, there's some things that have, have kind of surprised us from the standpoint of how well they've gone. And we're like, wow, I, I didn't expect that. And so what lessons have we, you know, identified? And then how do we incorporate those and to continue moving forward? Um, because I tell you, you know, one of the biggest challenges you have, especially on the listed side, um, is the problem of mass. We have so many people that need to go to these schools um, that generally keeps the schools shorter than we would like to see them. Um, but it's also time away from your units, which commanders don't like because, um, you know, you've got key personnel off to these courses, but it's part of our obligation. We have to send them. Is there a better way of doing this? Can we deliver to them where they're at? The problem then comes is, you know, do you get the same effect? Um, because I tell you, when you bring folks in, um, the ability to network, to talk to your peers, to understand that, hey, we're all facing the same kind of challenges. We're all learning together. You know, so there's, there is value still in brick and mortar. Um, but how can we do other things like maybe prerequisites for the course or, um, you know, after they've left the course, things that kind of refresh things for them over time with, you know, micro video learning or computer-based training delivered to them via different venues over time. Um, so we're looking at a lot of different things right now. Um, and the COVID is actually, you know, there, there's a lot of obviously negative aspects of COVID, but there's also some positive uh, aspects that we've learned a good bit. And now we've got to make sure we incorporate those things. Absolutely, sir. All right. Next question we have is from Mr. David Major asking, how would one go about instilling a value of curiosity? Over. Well, you've got to inspire it. Um, and, you know, in talking with folks, first of all, find out what interests them and then try to expand their horizons a little bit. Um, I tell you, one of the things that I've always done is um, I recommend historical fiction to people because it's a fairly entertaining story and it hooks them. And one of the examples I always use is um, uh, when I was at the basic school as a young lieutenant, my older sister was just getting started in the Richmond area um, for Hershey. She was working part time for Hershey. And uh, I went down to visit her apartment and she had nothing because she really wasn't making a whole lot of money. Um, and I just finished the book Killer Angels by Michael Shara. And uh, I said, well, you need a book to read. And she goes, well, I don't have one. I said, well, I just finished this one. She goes, oh, what's that? And uh, she had zero interest in anything regarding military history or the Civil War in particular. Um, so she goes, ah, OK, I'll read it. So I visit her again a couple of years later, and she's got Civil War magazines all over her coffee table. I'm like, what's up with this? She goes, it's your fault. You know, you hooked me with that book. So I wrote an article called A Warrior's Mind that, that was in the Marine Corps Gazette. And I talked about 
some of the aspects of what I talk about in this brief, um, but then, you know, why I do what I do. And then I had a list of, you know, because I keep track of all the books I read, um, top five in a couple of different categories. Like if you want to know more about, you know, whatever topic, and then I list five of the best books I've read on that topic. Um, but Again, it's to, you know, instead of making people do things, it's kind of hooking their interest and getting them more and more curious. Because one of the things I found, um, it works with me and works with other people, is, you know, if you read something that you really like, uh, you want to know more about it and you start reading more about it. And that self guided pursuit, in many cases, is better um, than trying to make people read and, and do a book report. You know, just trying to hook them, I guess, is the best way of putting it. I tell you something else that was pretty amazing was uh, it was you know, a number of years ago. Now was the Harry Potter thing. You know, kids just didn't read all that much anymore. And then all of a sudden we got kids reading you know seven eight hundred page books because they just loved Harry Potter. Now that's fiction, you know, wizards and other stuff. But they're reading. They're improving their vocabulary. They're getting a brain workout. They're not watching television. You know, they're they're you know it's that's that's a start. So got to find a way to hook them. All right, sir. Uh, I have a more of a comment and then I'll move on to the next question. But I, I wanted to make sure we acknowledge that we had an international partner jumping in here. Oh, good. Uh, uh, Thorsten, I apologize if I mispronounce your name out there uh, in Germany, but Thorsten Kordahl, who is a uh, officer instructor at the Forens Academy uh, for yeah. the there in Germany, uh, saying best regards from Germany. We have a constant discussion about our leadership culture the Iner Führung, and if it is still up to date, or do we need a more Spartan soldier? And I just wants to thank for a, uh, a presentation and providing an argument between a balanced approach between brain and muscle. Um, so we're, we're glad we had our international partners joining us well, here. Well, great. Thank you very much. That's fantastic. All right. And so moving on down to uh, from Lieutenant Colonel Manuel Zapeta, our de incoming deputy for the Kulak Center. Asking, it seems that process plus procedures equals product. You've mentioned focusing on the product vice the educational process. Will the core actually enhance the product by focusing on it and not adjusting the process or the procedures over? Yeah, because what we have to do is we have to get, you know, my headquarters is responsible for the procedures. And I've already, in a way, suspended those procedures by issuing a letter out to formal school commander saying, you have the authority to ex experiment. Tell me what you want to do. That's what we'll look out to figure out how well you're doing in the interim as we figure out what works and what doesn't work, what works better than what we're currently doing. Um, and once we have that identified, then we dive into the, the order for formal schools management and we change that so that we take the straitjacket off uh, and we stay focused on the product. Um, part of that is also identifying, okay, well, especially like an entry-level training, what do they need to know when they show up at the operating forces um, and remove everything they don't need to know right then and there so that you can focus on those things they need to know and ensure they're competent, ensure they understand and retain it when they move on. Um, and then maybe six, eight months out in the operating forces when they've got some experience under their belt, then we deliver some micro learning to them to build their skills until the next opportunity to bring them back for advanced MOS skill training. I mean, that's another way of going about it, but it's, again, focused on the product and what you can do. There's a, uh, a book by Kathy Davidson called The New Education, and one of the things she talks about is a lot of the universities in the United States, they focus on the, um, you know, their application process and how many people they turn away from the application process, like it's bragging rights. They brag about their professors and all the books they've written. Well, what about the students? What, what can they do when they move on, when they graduate from your school? And she said the, the big contrast there is with community colleges that are solely focused on the student, setting them up for success, making sure they have the skills they need in the areas where they're, where they're going to be operating or functioning, the jobs they're going to have when they leave the school. Um, and, you know, some universities have caught on to that, not all. So you're paying a lot of money for the reputation of the school. So there's that new education piece is how do you shift away from the process, away from the reputation of the school from the standpoint of, you know, great professors, really hard to get in to what are you doing to set your graduates up for success so that they are speaking for you. They're representing you when they're out in the operating forces. Oh, hey, you graduated from my college. You're doing a fantastic job. That's, that's great. You know, that's what we need to have from our training education system. We're preparing our Marines to deal with a very, very complex operating environment. 
how do we make sure they have the tools when they need those tools? And how do we build that and make sure they have what they need? That's what we got to focus on. All right, sir. I got uh, two more questions in the queue. And then for everyone out there, I think we'll uh, we'll cut it off after the second question here. Uh, but the first one comes from uh, another question from Sebastian Bay. I should note that uh, apart from being uh, a RAND uh, analyst and instructor at Georgetown, teaching wargaming to civilian students, he's also one of our new non-resident fellows. So we're glad he's Great. with us today. So he's asking, uh, sir, you mentioned decision forcing games and wargaming overall earlier. Can you expand on how you see these tools being worked into the PME systems, both for the officer core and enlisted ranks over? Yeah, it's, it's, again, it goes back to how to think, not what to think. You know, when you're dealing with, especially in a war game type environment, um, you're dealing with an opposing mind that is trying to beat you. Um, and, you know, ideally they're as smart or maybe even smarter than you are, because um, I think in many cases you learn more from law, losing than you do from winning. Um, but you keep going at it. You give them more reps and sets. You know, um, if one way doesn't work, all right, well, let's try something else. Um, but you're building that toolbox the entire time. Um, same thing with tactical decision games is when you're going through these things, you're forcing people to think, well, what would I do? I like to actually use historical tactical decision games from the standpoint of you present the scenario, a scenario that actually happened somewhere. You say, okay, what would you do about it? And you talk through it. Um, and once you talk through it, you say, okay, well, here's what actually happened. Um, and you lay it out. I think one of the best places I've seen that does that, um, that was really, really interesting, was at the Mount Vernon um, Historical Center there. Um, they have this big video display that you can sit in there and they do a presentation um, and they present the problem to you and they say, well, what would you do about, do about it? And you can discuss it and you can vote. And then they say, okay, here's what actually happened. And then they move on to the next segment. And I think that's a great way of doing things. But again, it's getting people to think. Um, it's getting people to consider things they might not necessarily have considered before, uh, especially if you can get in a discussion environment where everybody's kind of given and taken on a, you know, an equal basis um, and nobody's trying to dominate anybody else, but you're all trying to work together to come up with a solution. Um, boy, that's powerful. That's, that's good stuff. All right, sir. And final question is coming from our MCU chaplain, uh, Chaplain D'Souza asking, how do we balance technology as a conduit for learning with technology as a potential barrier for learning, uh, such as technology that does the thinking for us? Over. Yeah, there's, you know, that's one of the things that you get concerned about with artificial intelligence um, and machine learning, and, and people need to understand that better um, because it helps. It's an aid to decision making. It doesn't, it should not make decisions for you because it can easily be spoofed. Um, there's a lot of books out there that talk about those kind of things. Um, you know, the, the Russians are very, very adept. Um, they have something called Maskarovka. Um, it's part of everything they do, deception. You know, that, that whole thing about, you know, truth versus not truth, hey, no big deal. It's, it's, it's you know, it's all relative um, is the way they kind of look at things. Um, and they're perfectly okay with lying about things. Um, and when people buy it, you know, I think that's how they influence the uh, 2016 election. Um, and part of the challenge we have with all this is a lot of the younger folks coming up, um, they're not maybe not as skeptical as they need to be from the standpoint of not taking things hook, line, and sinker with if it's something along the lines of what they want to believe, a lot of them will just take it on board and not think deeply about it and say, wait a second, hold on. I don't know if that's necessarily accurate. Um, and that's what we have to have is that devil's advocate piece, even if you're only playing it with yourself, um, to be able to challenge your thinking, um, to be able to look around and see what other people have to say and not just write it off because it's different from what you think. So that technology piece is important. But as we talked about, we got to make sure we're not data rich and knowledge poor. You know, um, we can't just have facts at our fingertips and not really understand what those facts mean and how they get it, how they can interact with what we're doing or, or the, how they can be misinterpreted and used wrongly. Um, and all of that requires judgment. And that's a human function, not a machine function. Thank you, sir. And with that, that's the last question. Uh, I'll turn it back to you, sir, if you have any any parting shots or last comments. Yeah, I, I would just. You know, tell folks, you know, please read MCDP7, take a look at that thing, take it on board, try and understand the why. Um, and I suspect because you're tuning into this, you're probably already understand all the things we're talking about. But how do we expand this? How do we evangelize? How do we get our the, those Marines or, or the, our, our friends, our family or whoever that don't understand or don't want to understand these things? How do we help them understand, um, especially in the Marine Corps? 
Um, our maneuver warfare philosophy is based on subordinates able to take intelligent initiative uh, and beat the enemy no matter what. Outthink them, uh, outfight them, um, and you know the, the operating environment is getting more and more challenging all the time. You know, technology proliferating, so we can't always protect. Uh, count on the technological edge. We have to be able to count on the intellectual edge, um, and that's what this is about: keep honing that intellectual edge and helping our subordinates do the same. All right, thank you very much, sir. And on that note, I would like to thank everybody who joined us for today's broadcast, and our, our sincere thanks from the Krulak Center to Major General Mullen for willing to to jump in on our programming here and share his PME on PME again for uh, another time with a different audience. So uh, with that, that concludes our broadcast for today. We hope you can join us next week where we'll be joined by uh, Dr. Yuval Weber, who is the Krulak Center's Bren Chair for Russian Military and Political Strategy, where he'll be discussing Russian private military companies. We hope you can all join us then. Thank you. Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected.